Bad weather, you can end up with a drone layer. The other reason you can end up with a drone layer is if the queen gets really chill, it can kill all that sperm in her spermatheca, and she ends up with a drone layer because the sperm all died. Um, she can also end up with, so you often see a lot of drone layers, they weren't drone layers in the fall, and the first thing in the spring, you look in there and it's just nothing but drones. And that's a chilled queen. Um, also, sometimes queens just run out of sperm. That can happen in the middle of summer, they just run out. You know, they, they mate once, one little period of time in their whole life, and once they start laying, they never mate again, and then they eventually run out and then they become a drone layer. So that's your three reasons you might have a drone layer. Um, so basically they're just laying unfertilized eggs and they be all become drones. <coughs> um, usually you don't have a lot of multiple eggs, you have just singles, like the queen's laying fine and you might even see the queen. If she mated late, you might notice she's got a funny bulge right behind her thorax at the top of her abdomen and she can't even get her abdomen all the way in the cell very well because she's kind of malformed. If she just runs out of sperm or she gets chilled, she'll just look like a normal queen, except she's laying nothing but drones. Um, so, usually the way you tell a drone laying queen from laying workers, one of the differences is you don't usually see a lot of multiple eggs in a drone laying queen. She's laying singles, where laying workers, you're seeing dozens of eggs sometimes in, in one cell. Does that make sense? Um, so the solution is, if you can't find her, I, if you just give them a frame of eggs every week for about three weeks, usually they'll, they'll straighten it out. But it's better to find her. If you can find her and kill her, you're going to stack the deck in your favor, because then they'll immediately start raising a new queen, and, and you'll have everything set right in a few weeks. Um, there are all these people who are all intent on killing all those drones. I don't care. They'll all drift another hive anyway. Why do I want to bother to kill them? Then some other hive won't have to spend the resources to raise as many drones because they pretty much have a threshold for how many drones they want. When there's that many drones hanging around the hive, they quit raising them. So me killing drones is just going to cost some other hive uh, more drones they've got to raise where they might drift over there and save them having to raise as many. <coughs> so I don't worry about it. Um, playing workers. If a hive is broodless for a while, um, probably a couple of weeks will do the job, but they have to be queenless a little longer than that because if you took the queen out today, they wouldn't be broodless yet. They wouldn't, be, they wouldn't have a lack of open brood for another nine days. In nine days, then they won't have any more open brood. But then two weeks after that, you might end up with some laying workers. That'd be about the earliest we'd have them, and it might take another week after that. Um, but it's that lack of brood, open brood pheromone that causes laying workers. So um, once you get lane workers, well, you've always got lane workers, actually, but uh, once you get a lot of lane workers, then you've got a problem because they keep laying all these un unfertilized eggs that all develop into drones. In the early stages of, uh, of laying workers, what you'll see is some spotty brood. In other words, you'll see uh, an egg here, and an egg over here, and a larva here, and a larva here, and a cap with a drone cap on it here and a, and a cap with a drone cap on it here, but they're just scattered all over. They're not in any kind of pattern. They're not together. A drone laying queen, sometimes you'll just get a whole solid frame full of drones, but with a with laying workers, they're just scattered here and there. They're not. They're never in one solid mass, at least in the early, the early signs will be like that. Sometimes you don't even see any multiple eggs at that point. You just see this spotty brood. Um, and whatever brood you actually do see that's capped is usually drones. Well, you know, there might be some old stuff that's still workers, but probably not. By the time, by the time they've reached the point of being laying workers, usually all the worker broods emerge. So, um, the, at that point, where you're still just in the spotty brood um, level, you'll often have queen cells. And, and actually, if you wait and let them cap them, you'll see they've got a drone cap on them. It's a round cap on them. They know it's a drone. They, they know it's not going to work. Um, they, they put a flat cap on it if it was a real queen. Um, sort of rounded, but mostly flat. Not, not like a kick cereal, you know? Um, so they might have some queen cells right then. Now, if you intervene right then, if you see that kind of spotty brood, a few queen cells, and you give them a frame of brood, they'll start raising the queen right away and probably set it right. In fact, you can probably introduce a queen at that point. When they're building those queen cells, you can probably introduce a queen and they probably accept it. And it worked fine. But once they tear down those queen cells, which they will, um, then and they start, you start seeing multiple eggs in every cell, then you can't get them to accept the queen because every one of these laying workers generates just enough pheromones that all together added up, they think maybe they've got a queen and they're not willing to accept a new one. <coughs> and 
another symptom is you typically see eggs on the sides of the worker cells, and you often see multiple eggs on the pollen. <coughs> the laying workers can't reach the bottom, and so they're laying eggs anywhere they can reach. Um, don't assume just because you see some multiple eggs that you got laying workers. Sometimes a queen will lay some multiple eggs, especially when she first starts laying, or especially if it's a virgin that just got mated. Sometimes they backfill the brood nest, and then they open up an area for her to lay. It just isn't that big yet, and she and she gets ahead of things, and she'll lay some doubles. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you have laying workers, but if you got dozens of eggs in there, you got laying workers. But, um, I don't think most of these are worth the trouble, so I'll, I'll stick with the simple ones. If you raise your own queens, if you stick a queen cell in there, you might set it right without a whole lot of effort um, because you've already got queen cells. In there. <coughs> That's probably the simplest, really. Um, for an out yard, I think the simplest is just take all the <coughs> of, of, you know, 20, 30 feet from where all the hives are, shake them all out on the ground, and put all that equipment on the other hives, um, and, have, and you're done. You don't have that hive in that colony anymore, but that colony was just, it's just going to cost you three more trips, four more trips to this bee yard to try and fix it. So why bother? Sometimes if I'm in an out yard and I've got like, um, let's say I've set up a bunch of nukes out in this out yard and I was hoping to get some queens made in, and one of them did, and two of them didn't, and they went laying worker on me, I might just combine all three of those because the other one, none of them are a big, strong colony. And, and I've done that quite often and gotten away with it just. Three, three works really well. Two, two, you don't have enough confusion. But three, you throw all these bees together, and there's not a them or us kind of attitude. It's more of what the heck is going on attitude, <laughs> and they just kind of you know move on with life. So three of them, you can sometimes just throw them together and, and get by with it. But that's what I do in an out yard. In my backyard, I tend to do the open brood method, um, and uh, this is what I recommend to any hobbyist who has it in their backyard. If you've got more than one hive, you can take a frame of brood and eggs and give them a frame every week for three weeks, and they'll usually start clean cells and it'll fix everything. It's the simplest. Everything else is really kind of a waste of your time. I already said the clean cell. If you have to have a clean cell, that's, that's probably worth doing. But uh, the, the, a lot of this confusion on, on uh, laying workers is this idea that there's only one laying worker in there. And the, them being queenless is the cause, but it's not really them being queenless. The reason it's important to realize that it's them being broodless that's the problem is because you can fix it by giving them brood. Um, I can't get them to accept the queen, but I can get them to accept the brood, and by giving them brood, I can fix the problem. Um, it, it's true that they're broodless because they're queenless, but that's an indirect uh, effect, and that doesn't help me solve the problem because I can't get them to accept the queen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, this is just background to, to prove what I just said. This is in the wisdom of the hive, and you can go look that up later. <coughs> this is the other problem is people think there's one laying worker in there, and they think if they can just solve this one laying worker, they're going to fix the problem. A typical, um, a typical queen right hive has about 70 laying workers in it. A, a laying worker hive has about... 10,000 laying workers in it. Um, so your problem isn't a laying worker, your problem is thousands of laying workers. So you're not going to solve the problem just by somehow finding that one laying worker and getting rid of it. That's not, that's not your problem. Um, now, if you put the open brood in there, what happens is it, it changes them back into normal bees again. It, it suppresses their ovaries again, and then they go, and then, and then it works. And that's basically saying that. Um, this is a myth that's been out there for a long time. You go out and you shake them out and then the laying worker can't find its way home and then you can introduce a queen. Well, I think the problem with this is it's one of those things that worked off just often enough that, that the myth kept getting perpetuated. I'm sure some people have done this and it worked. Because sometimes you demoralize and confuse bees enough, you can get them to accept something they wouldn't accept otherwise. So you shake them all out on the ground and you introduce this queen and they all come back and maybe maybe you demoralize them enough that they that they actually accept that queen. Never worked for me, but but I've had people say it works, so I have to believe they weren't lying to me. <coughs> but I never got it to work. Um, and, and most everybody I've ever talked to who tried it never got it to work, but I'm, I've met at least one or two people who said they got it to work. Um, another problem is robbing. Part of the problem with robbing is realizing whether or not they're actually being robbed. Every afternoon, on a sunny afternoon, when the sun's out like this, and it's a nice warm afternoon, and they've been raising a bunch of young bees, there'll be a bunch of young bees go out for an orientation flight. 
somewhere maybe one in the afternoon. I can't guarantee when it'll happen because first of all, you may not be on daylight savings time like Arizona, or you may be um, whatever. But probably somewhere on a nice sunny afternoon, there'll be like thousands of bees out there hovering around your hive, and you think, oh my gosh, I'm being robbed. And it's there, or, or you'll think they're swarming or something when actually they're disoriented. A whole bunch of them will go out all at once and they'll kind of hover in front of the hive like this. They'll be fuzzy. If you look at them, they look kind of light colored to you because of the hair on them. And many bees are fuzzy. Uh, robber bees usually are not fuzzy. Quite often they're shiny and black because they've got all their hair pulled out. But they're usually not fuzzy because they're, they're at least in there frantically ripping apart wax and getting honey on them. So they don't tend to look, they, they tend to look kind of shiny and they don't tend to look fuzzy. Um, so one of the problems is you got to make sure that they're actually uh, being robbed. Let's talk a little about what sets off robbing. I think the number one cause of robbing is feeding. It's one of those mysteries to me that I, I constantly run into people on forums who say, feeding can't hurt. And I, I think, do they even keep bees? Because I don't understand how you can say that. I mean, um, all of my ant problems I can trace back to feeding syrup. All of my robbing problems, I can pretty much trace back to feeding syrup. So I don't see how you can say that feeding never hurt anything. I don't understand that because I think it's one of the leading causes of beekeeping problems. But um, if you end up having to feed them in a dearth because they're going to starve to death, then you, you know, you're going to have to really try to manage to, keep, to prevent them from robbing. You're going to have to reduce all their entrances right off the bat. You probably, if you're going to feed one of them, feed all of them. If you're not, if, if you're if you're only going to feed a few of them, then feed the strong ones and then steal the cap honey and give it to the weak ones. But <clears throat> whatever you do, don't just feed the weak ones because you're just going to you're just going to get them robbed out. Um, so your best bet is to try to prevent it because once you get a feeding frenzy going and a robbing frenzy going, it's it's just scary. It's, it's amazing what what force this colony can mobilize against that other colony. It just, it's mind-boggling. Um, I've noticed when I'm setting up queens, when I'm setting up mating nukes, and I make them queenless, you know, you just set them out there and they're queenless, and they're much more likely to get robbed than if I had a queen cell in there or if they had a queen. Um, I think it's not just that they're small. I think the other bees sense that they're queenless and sense that as a weakness, and they, and they tend to go after them. So anytime you're setting up a queenless hive, I would assume I'm going to have to deal with, I'm going to have to prevent some robbing and reduce the entrance now. Don't wait till they're getting robbed. <coughs> and like I said, make sure they're really getting robbed and it's not just a bunch of uh, orienting bees. Um, robber bees also tend to be pretty frantic and you won't always see wrestling, but wrestling, let me put it this way, if you see them wrestling, they're definitely being robbed. If you don't see them wrestling, that doesn't prove they're not being robbed because they may just be so demoralized they gave up. But, um, but if they're wrestling, they're definitely being robbed. If they're not wrestling, and, and, the, and the bees that are coming and going are, are, are pretty systematic, they act like they know what they're doing, they act like, you know, they're just walking right in like, like they know what they're doing, even like they, like they, they have somewhere to go. Um, I tend to think those are foragers. Of course, anybody who comes back with a little column is a forager, you know, can't tell when they're coming back with nectar necessarily, but you can tell when they're coming back with pollen. pollen and robbers are not hauling pollen into the hive. So, you know, that's another way to kind of distinguish some of that traffic. Um, if you're getting close to dark, you can always just put screen over the whole entrance, cover the whole thing up, and anybody that shows up after dark is, anybody that shows up the next morning is probably a robber. Now, if you close it up in the middle of the afternoon to stop the robbing, which I try to stop it any way you can, <coughs> you probably want to, after dark, open it up and let all those bees in that have piled up that live there and then close it back up, and then in the morning, whatever piles up at the entrance is, is robbers. And then I wait till they go home. And then after they go home, I poke a hole in that screen just big enough for a bee to get in and out, and then leave it like that for a little while. And then maybe widen it so two bees can get in and out and then leave it like that. The screen will help confuse the robbers. The robbers go by smell, and the bees that live there know where they live, and they know how to get in and out. They, they're in a different mindset. I know you think, these are bees and these are bees, and these bees can figure out how to get in here, but these bees can't figure out how to get in there. How is that? Well, the bees that live there are not in the same mindset as the robbers. They're not think, they don't think the same. They're not going through the same mental processes. So the screen confuses the heck out of the robbers, and it really doesn't confuse the ones that live there for very long at all. They just walk along the screen until they find the hole, and usually they remember where it was anyway. So 
Um, yeah, the most important thing is to stop them immediately. There are very few things in beekeeping you need to do something right now. I will say there's two. One of them is this. If they're being robbed, you need to stop it as quickly as possible. A wet sheet, staple some screen wire over the entrance, something. You've got to stop it. <coughs> now that you stopped it and the robbers have started to cut back, you can start figuring out how you're going to let this hive free fly because you can't combine them for very long or they're going to overheat, they don't have any water, they don't have any, you know, they need resources coming in. So then you're going to have to figure out what to do. But the first thing you've got to do is stop the robbing. Um, the second thing you got that you have to deal with right now is when you have a swarm hanging on a branch. Um, it's not going to be there at 2 o'clock tomorrow. So, <laughs> probably not anyway. I wouldn't say it's guaranteed it won't be, but it's probably not going to be there at 2 o'clock tomorrow. So you probably need to do something right now. And on everything else, you can probably wait, talk to your beekeeping mentors and figure out what to do. But, um, I like number 8 hardware cloth, but any old screen will do to stop that up. You know, just staple it over the entrance. Screen will work better than anything else because it confuses the robbers and still allows the bees that live there to ventilate pretty well. Um, so I much prefer screen wire over putting a wood block in there to reduce it. The wood block only leaves one place that the smell's coming out and, and the robbers will find that. But the screen has smell coming out all along it and the robbers will be fighting to get in over here through the screen and they'll never succeed. So. <coughs> If you go sprinkle some uh, flour on the bees that are coming and going with the hive that's being robbed and then watch to see where they show up with your other hives and then pop the tops off of those, just pull the lids off, um, all those bees will have to stay home and guard their hive. <laughs> um, Michael, have you actually done that? Of just the strong ones, yes. I've never had the nerve to do, to do Jim Fisher's version where you don't even bother to figure out which ones they are, you just take all of them. <laughs> um, I've never had the nerve to do that one, yeah, but, but, uh, but I have done that where you just figure out which, which ones are doing the robbing, pull theirs off. Yeah. I was working with this guy and he read this article about in your honey supers to bore a hole in there and then that way the bees go directly in there and they store honey in there instead of going through the door there. So he goes down there and he bores a hole in the back of his way out of there. The guard bees are sitting on the porch waiting for the, the attack. The bees come in from the back hole there. Get out of there. I've, I've had that happen too. Yeah. yeah. I had that happen on a top bar hive that had an entrance at both ends, and and it was all right until the colony kind of shrunk down and they sort of abandoned that part. And then the robbers were coming in the back door and stealing from behind while they were all guarding the front door, and, and it didn't work very well. Um. Yeah, this is Jim Fisher's, of, of the one of removing all of the covers. I, I haven't had the nerve to try that one. But I, do, I, I can tell you how some of this works, though. And, and, and this, you can use this to your advantage for other purposes. Let's say you want to move a hive from where it is now to your yard, and it's in the middle of the afternoon. And you don't really want to wait till dark when everybody's home. You just want to go, right? you got things to do. So you pull the lid off and wait about a half an hour, and pretty much all of the bees will come back. They'll start nazanobbing, and all the returning bees will stay. They won't leave. They'll just keep coming back and staying because the, they know the hive's been disrupted and all the bees at the top are, shaped, are, are, are fanning Nazanoff. Now, if you want to up the Nazanoff, you just pull a frame of bees out of that hive and shake it back in. Just you know, shake them in. Almost all the bees that you just shook back in will go straight to the top, stick their butt in the air, and start Nazanoffing. So you can make it happen even faster. But basically, in about a half an hour, almost everybody will be home and they'll stay home. And now you can close it up, load it on your truck, and go and you're probably not going to leave very many bees. Where if you just loaded it up and left, all those field bees out there are going to come home and, there's, and, and the hive's not there. Of course, if there's other hives, maybe you don't care, they'll just move into the other hives. I never quite understood the obsession with every bee has to be in its own hive, you know. Oh my gosh, they might drift. Well, they're still in my hives, I don't care, they're making me honey, I don't care where they are. <laughs> Um, robber screens are interesting, but it's kind of a variation on the, on the idea of the screen, but I made these out of the Brushy Mountain uh, screen doors that I bought. I noticed that since I posted this on my website, Brushy Mountain made that same notch and put a little uh, metal thing to open and close on it so that they turned their screen doors, which I bought and converted into a robber screen, they turned them into a robber screen now. But um, it's just great. I think that's... But I, will, I have the idea they come up in this corner up here, right there, and then they have to find their way over and get in the entrance over here. See, so it confuse them more. I'm not sure you need that much. Um, UC Davis has a plan out there 
where it's just just this uh, this this board here and this board here and this screen and that's it. It's just open on the top and it's just tight against the bottom board at the bottom, and it's just two boards that are screwed on to the to the front of the hive and then that screen wire and it's just open at the top and it apparently works just as well. It still works on the principle that the returning robbers are down here smelling the entrance and they just aren't smart enough to find a convoluted way in where the ones that live there are in a different mindset than they do. That's the other side of the same one. This is the side that would be facing the hive. So they come in that notch up at the top and then go over and come in the notch at the bottom and come in the entrance. This is for a bottom entrance. I have already designed one for a top entrance. Um, <coughs> Vicks Vapor Rub actually does work pretty well. You put it around the entrance, it just confuses the robbers because they can't smell that honey. They're trying to smell honey and all they can smell is Vicks. Um, <laughs> Wouldn't that qualify as treating my like <laughs> 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 trying, trying to keep them from getting robbed. Um, sometimes they're just so weak, there's just nothing you can do to fix it. You may as well combine them with a strong hive or, or combine several weak ones and try to make a strong hive. Probably it works better to take the weak ones and combine them with a strong hive because the strong hive will kind of maintain some cohesiveness and three weak hives may still be in such confusion they may just keep getting robbed even though there are more bees in it now. Um, yeah, this is, seems to freak out a lot of beekeepers. They find queen cells and they're just sure they're going to swarm any second now. Well, they might, but um, I wouldn't destroy the queen cells. That's probably a bad idea. <coughs> I don't know where people get the idea that queen cells are bad, but um, here's, here's how that usually works. As soon as the first queen cell gets capped, if they're getting ready to swarm, the first nice day after that they leave. <coughs> so odds are if you open it up and you find some capped swarm cells, they probably already swarm. So you destroy all the swarm cells, and now they're hopelessly queenless. They have no means of raising a queen because you just destroyed all the queen cells. So um, I definitely would not do that. Um, you got some other options. You can split them, you can, which basically just simulates what they're going to do. But um, we already talked about this. I'm going to that. But I'd like to just tangentially to that if you've got like a three or four year old queen. Do you go in, pinch her, and put in a new queen, or do you just let the bees take care of it and supersede her? Um, my theory is if we keep if we keep requeening for them, then we are not selecting for something that in nature is very strongly selected for, which is the ability to detect that a queen is failing <coughs> and replace her. Um, Michael Palmer says he started selecting for seamless supersedures. So what you want is a queen is, is bees that are smart enough to not only detect that the queen is failing and replace her, but that replacement queen emerges and starts laying before the other one gets disposed of. So there, there's never a point in there where they're queenless. So they sense that she's failing, they raise a new queen, the mother and daughter are laying for a while, and eventually the mother goes away. So um, I I think you're 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 not exactly selecting against it, but you're failing to select for it, where in nature it's selected very strongly for, because any colony that doesn't sense that the queen's failing and replace her is going to die out, and that's the end of the line. Other than whatever drones they produce that have already passed the genes on, that's the end of that direct line. <coughs> so no, I don't, I don't go around routinely recleaning them, because I think, it's, I, I think it's failing to select for something that I think is important. Um, if that makes sense. Now, if I see one that's failing, I'm going to requeen them because I, I don't see much point in letting them fail. But yeah. In commercial beekeeping, is it standard operating procedure to destroy those queen cells? To destroy the queen cells? It's, for some guys, it is. Some some of them do that. Yeah. Some of them don't. Um, Doolittle used seems to write. Like, seems like 30 or 40 years ago. Yeah, Doolittle do used to do that, and Miller used to do that, and it seemed to be a popular idea for a long time. But it also helps, though, if you're a commercial guy and you've got a lot of extra queens around anyway, and you destroyed all the queen cells and end up queenless, you just throw another queen in there and move on. Um, but if you're a hobbyist and, and you had two hives and they were both trying to swarm, you destroyed all the queen cells, now they're both hopeless, hopelessly queenless, and you really don't have any other options. Yeah. The question I've never thought to ask before, but if you find 
queen cells, cat or almost cats, but you also find the queen. If you want to prevent them from swarming, could you just remove the queen? And how often would that work? But it, you know, it always depends. Yeah. If they're really, really strong and really, really crowded, they might, they might swarm anyway. If, if you split them and took the queen and put her in a new place, it, it'll work most of the time. If you take half the bees and put them someplace else, then it'll work most of the time. It won't work all the time, but it'll work most of the time. Um, if you split them five ways to Sunday, it'll work 99% of the time um, to, take, to make a bunch of splits and, and take the queen to a new location. You had a question? Yeah, I was just an observation. I had, the, I was doing a class with kids and I had an observation pie. And that morning I had taken a frame of brood and, and eggs and put it in the observation pie along with the worker bees and the nurse bees. And uh, by then, by, within four hours, they already started making four queen cells. That's how quickly they, they noticed that they don't have a queen in the end that. Right. Two hours they know they're queenless and then four, yeah. It, started at least feeding some as queens and often start, start building cells. It's not so obvious when you have a big hive when you're in an observation hive. It's, it's a lot more obvious because you can see everything they're doing. <coughs> um, why, why do some bees just always mess up comb? I'm, I'm always amazed at the people who say, well, if you use foundationless, they're going to mess up comb. Well, they mess up comb and use foundation too, so I don't quite understand the, 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 your point. Yeah. The reason they do that is because they're mongrelized. Instead of having one complete strain of race in a hive like you do in most climatic areas, you're told to buy three or four different types, see what you like, and then you end up with a hodgepodge with a mixture of bees fighting, like who's going to control the local area, and they all build different comb sizes because every race or strain to be different has to be slightly different. She's, she's probably right. I don't, I don't know if she is or isn't, but she's probably right. Because if you think about it, it does seem to be genetics. And it seems to be that they just can't get it together and build straight parallel combs like most honeybees do. They start building little things and the Tower of Babel. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and, they do it, and they do it as often on foundation as they do it not on foundation. The difference between foundationless and foundation is that with foundation, at least it's a clean slate every frame. Every frame they have to decide to screw it up again. You know, where with foundationless, once they screw one of them up, they're all going to be screwed up because they built parallel homes. So once the first one's all wonky, the next one's going to be all wonky, and the next one's going to be all wonky because they built parallel homes. <coughs> the thing I run into real often is somebody who gets a top bar high and they dump a bunch of bees in there. They don't keep track of it, and they do build one wild one. And then they write me and they say, well, you know, they started building the comb kind of off, but I think, I'm, I think they'll get the hang of it. <laughs> they, they got the hang of it, and I'm just going to keep repeating that same error all the way through. So it's, it's only an error in your mind, it's not an error in their mind. In their mind, they're building perfectly good comb. But, um, so, yeah. I've trapped these and I put 10 frames in the top and they come up. 99 out of times out of 10, they will, they will draw it in a straight line. And every once in a while, they just draw it. It brought 90 degrees to that. Exactly. I had one time, instead of going in the hive, they went under the bottom and drawed it from the bottom of the hive down there. So occasionally they will do what, whatever their natural tendency is to do at that time. I mean, it's not 100% anything. And, and that's part of why I say I think a lot of it's, I, I think some of it's genetics. I think some of these just, they just, they got a whole different idea of what they should be doing. But 99 times out of 100, you're right. Give them good foundationless frames, they just build them on the frames, and it works fine. Um, but some of it too is giving them space. If you, if you, if, even if you buy foundation, plastic foundation, whatever, and you space them out evenly, then you give them a little more space in there. They've got a little more space to build a comb in between and ignore the foundation. <coughs> Bees always prefer to ignore the foundation and build their own comb. So you don't want to give them enough room to do that. You want to, you want to crowd them together where they don't have the room to do that. At an inch and a quarter, they just plain don't have the room to do that. At an inch and three eighths, sometimes they'll build a comb out from the surface of the foundation so that there's this gap, a quarter inch gap behind the one they build out from the surface and then there's this comb sticking out here. Sometimes they'll just build it right between off the top bars, right between the two. Sometimes they build fins across between the two this way. Um, it depends on how much they dislike your, your foundation and their genetics, I don't know. But, but the spacing helps. 
if you crowd them together more, they, they've got less room to do that kind of screw up because they have to build the brood comb a certain thickness. And if you crowd it together enough that they can't build that much thickness between the two, then they tend to, to give up on the idea and build it on the foundation because they just don't have the room to mess it up. Um, unless they decide to go for the fins. But, um, Um, and, and, and some of it is they just, they just plain don't like foundation. They prefer to build their own comb. I, and I think when they build, um, when they're building foundation, I, I don't know if they view it as damaged comb or what they view it as, but they definitely don't view it as that they're building comb because when they build comb, they're hanging in a festoon. There's all kinds of communication. If you read Huber's book back there on how they're building comb, there's all this communication going on between the two sides. This bee on this side is communicating with this bee on this side. This bee's carving the bottom of this cell. And these three bees over here are carving a third of each of those lozenges in the bottom of this cell plus the bottoms of some other cells. And these bees are actually on opposite sides at the same time scraping this wax down because if they aren't right lined up, then this one will break through. And so they're like coordinating this on both sides, you know. I need you to work on the bottom of this one so I can finish the bottom of this one in there. There's all this communication going on. You stick a wall of foundation in there and they can't do any of that. They have to just kind of live with the fact that they can't communicate and they, and, and they don't, they obviously don't like it. Just take a frame out of any box and let them, with foundation in there, and they'll build a comb right there in that gap, right off the bat, because that's, the, they love to build their own comb. Um, Jay Smith makes the observation that if you do that, the queen will lay in that one before she'll lay in any other frame. Even if you put a whole bunch of frames of found, nicely drawn foundation in there and you put one natural comb in there, the queen will lay in that natural comb right off the bat because she prefers natural comb. So if you get combs that aren't where they belong, you, you do a cutout. You may as well learn to do that. The sooner, the better. The sooner you learn to do that, the better off you're going to be as a beekeeper. <coughs> a cutout's really simple. You cut the comb out, you lay it in the frame, you put rubber bands around it so it stays in the frame. Now, that sounds simple. Sometimes it is that simple. Sometimes it isn't that simple. If it's brand new comb, it's, it's soft like putty. And, some, and if it's got nectar in it, then it's heavy and soft. And you pretty much may as well just scrap that because you're not going to be able to get that to, to go in that frame and not just fall apart and make a sticky mess. But if it's a brood comb, you'll probably get by with it even if it is that soft if you learn to be gentle enough. And if it's got any cocoons in it at all, then it's really easy to cut it out and throw it in the frame. I say really easy. I mean, you know, it's still covered with bees. You still got to get the bees off because you're going to have to lay, lay it on your hand while you lay the frame on there, while you get the rubber bands on there. It gets a little complicated. Dee has some wonderful things back here. Um, <coughs> I assume she invented it. I never know. She has stuff that I've never seen anybody else have, and so I always assume she invented it. And, and she probably did. But once in a while I ask her and she tells me, oh no, this other guy built that for me. But um, anyway, she has these swarm catching frames, she calls them. I, I don't think the name is quite apropos because I picture a swarm in a tree and somehow I'm going to catch them with these. I don't see how that's going to work. But she's thinking in terms of swarm traps and now she's got this wild comb in a swarm trap and she's cutting it out and putting it in these frames. But it's basically two sides and they're hinged and you lay the comb on the wires and you just close it and put it in there. It's really easy to do. It doesn't require